Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jonas. Uh, I'm originally from Switzerland. However, the last four and a half years I've been living in Tokyo, Japan. And I'm working for a company called HDE in Japan. And we are hiring like everybody else. So if you're uh, looking for a job or if you're a university student, we also have a fantastic internship program where we will pay your flight to and from Japan and you will have a paid internship for six to eight weeks with us. Uh, if you're interested in any of this, uh, please feel free to come talk to me or check out our website. Uh, just quick links where to find me if you have any complaints or feedback after the talk. Um, I'm, I'm ochi.ch on Twitter, I'm OG on GitHub, and the company website is hd.co.jp slash en. So yeah, my talk is called what, uh, Why You Might Want to Go Async. Um, but thinking about that, uh, it's maybe not a great talk title because before I can explain you why you should go async, I should probably explain what I mean when I say async. Um, so who here in the room understands what I, thinks they understand what, what I mean when I say async? Or who has used async? Okay, most people, so you can probably leave and go to another talk. No. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, async is short for asynchronous, and more specifically when I say async, I mean asynchronous I.O. And especially in this talk, I will be focusing on asynchronous networking, um, so reading and writing to a socket, doing HTTP requests, responding to HTTP requests, doing database queries, that kind of stuff. And it's the opposite of synchronous or blocking code. And probably the best way to illustrate syncing versus asyn uh, synchronous versus asynchronous is to just give some example of libraries on either side. So the probably most famous synchronous uh, library uh, in the Python world right now is Requests, which is a uh, HTTP client library that probably most of you are familiar with. It's synchronous, as is Django, which is a web framework, Flask, also web framework. All of these are blocking and synchronous. And there's uh, Postgres libraries, class SQL libraries, um, libraries to talk to AWS. When actually most libraries you will find on PyPI will usually by default be in a synchronous and blocking mode of operation. So what are some asynchronous libraries that we have? Uh, there's Twisted, which has been around since about the Bronze Age. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been around forever and it's a very, very good library if you wanna do um, asynchronous networking in Python. Uh, they have support for every protocol under the sun. Uh, there's also Tornado, which is uh, similar to Twisted, an asynchronous networking library, but more focused on HTTP servers and HTTP clients. And since Python 3.4, we have AsyncIO, a thing called AsyncIO in the standard library, which allows you to do asynchronous networking right out of the standard library. And there's also Scenic, which is a Flask-like, and there was a talk about that yesterday as well. Uh, so it's a web server, uh, web framework, but it's asynchronous. There's also Curio, which is an alternative to AsyncIO. There's AIOPG, which is an extremely fast Postgres client. AIO Boto Core, if you talk to AWS services. And since I'm giving a talk, I might as well just shamelessly plug some stuff that I wrote. And there's a thing called AAPNS, which is asynchronous Apple push notification service client library. And Arsenic, which is an asynchronous web driver client. Uh, if you're not familiar with web driver, that's, uh, you might be familiar with Selenium. So it's like Selenium, but async. And in asynchronous IO, there's a couple of uh, fundamental core concept, and at the very, very core, there's this thing called the event loop. The event loop is a thing that will run all your other code, and it will schedule all your functions to run in the correct time, ideally, and it will handle the IO that is coming in and that needs to go out, and making sure that uh, your stuff gets called uh, whenever it's possible. And the other fundamental block of asynchronous I.O. code uh, these days is a thing called coroutines. Previously, uh, when we did asynchronous uh, code in Python, we did just callback hell, uh, so you write callbacks for everything. Uh, these days, we can use uh, coroutines, and a coroutine is a function which allows you to do cooperative multitasking, and that's where the name comes from, it's cooperative subroutine. And a coroutine is basically a Python function, but one that is aware of asynchronous networking. So in general, in async I.O., uh, what we try to do is to have I.O., so anything that reads and writes to sockets or the network, to be non-blocking. 
Um, however, your logic, and by logic I basically mean if statements in Python, uh, is still blocking. So yeah, uh, after this short crash course of what async is, or what I mean when I say async, why, why, do you, might, why you might wanna go async, the answer is actually simple and I will just give it to you, it's money. Uh, you can save a lot of money by moving from synchronous uh, network servers or synchronous clients uh, to asynchronous servers or clients. But again, the title why you might wanna go async is probably a really bad title and a better title might be why does going async save you money? So a very common mantra you hear people complain about Python is that Python is slow. And the re one of the reasons why people say that, especially when they compare it to something like Node.js or Golang, et cetera, is that in uh, our default world of synchronous web servers, such as Django, a single process or thread can only ever handle one request at a time. So that's obviously not, not enough. We cannot just have our app handle one request at a time. So what we uh, generally did in the past or even in the present is we just spawn up more threads, we spawn up more processes, we spawn up more servers uh, to handle more than one request at a time. And doing this, we waste a lot of resources, primarily CPU, but also a lot of memory because all these extra processes uh, yeah, they, they need extra memory overhead to run. And a thing to realize in where you might wanna go async is that most of the time you spend when you write a web server or if you write a web crawler or something like that, is that most of the time you're not actually spending um, doing Python code, you're actually just waiting for somebody else to give you data. Uh, this might be your database, this might be a third party service, this might be the website you're trying to download, this might be the client trying to upload a GIF of a cat. So actually surprisingly little time is wasted in your Python code. Your template render engine is usually not the bottleneck or where you waste most of your time. So yeah, this whole mantra of Python is slow. Again, it's probably not um, entirely true or at least not very honest. Um, I would rather say Python is inefficient but that's also not true because Python isn't inefficient. Um, synchronous Python is. If you're writing synchronous web servers, synchronous web clients, synchronous database clients, you're wasting a lot of time um, just waiting for nothing. So let's have asynchronous Python come to our rescue. And I will give an example here. Um, I've been talking a lot about web servers and I will talk, continue to talk a lot about web servers because I believe everybody understands roughly how the web works, um, but all of this also applies to databases, database clients, servers, what, what, what not. But yeah, in this example I will, give, uh, I will implement a little uh, handler that handles a post request. It will read the post data the client sends us and save it to a database and then return some identifier as JSON to the client. So let's implement this in a synchronous web framework. Uh, this is uh, I hope you can sort of read it. Uh, I don't know if it's big enough. Um, but yeah, this is not a real web framework. It's just how you might do it. So you have a handler. It takes a request. It returns a response. On the first line, it reads the post data from the client. Second line, it saves it to the database. And then the last line, it just returns the response. So what happens if we have two requests coming in? And they're on the right side in the comments. And so yeah, the first request starts handling. It reads the post data, it saves it to the database, the second request is still waiting on the top, cannot do anything, first request is starting to write the response, second request is still waiting patiently at the beginning, and yeah, the first request is finally done, and the second request can start being handled, and it will also go one step by step through this. And this is a very simple example, but I hope that you can sort of understand uh, where the fundamental problem of synchronous web servers lies. So let's rewrite this uh, amazing web handler uh, in an asynchronous fashion and it might look something like this. And uh, the keen-eyed among you will have noticed this crazy thing that I, that I do no longer uh, define my function which is def handler, I give it this crazy argument, uh, keyword async. And also we don't return uh, response anymore. Now the async keyword uh, is what defines a coroutine function in Python. 
Uh, prior to Python 3.5, there was a decorator to do that, and now we have this nice keyword to make it easier. And an important thing to understand about the async keyword is that the async keyword doesn't make your function asynchronous. The async keyword allows your function to potentially be asynchronous. Because if we look at the second line, uh, you see this, again, this crazy new keyword that you might not yet be familiar with, await. The await keyword is actually what makes your, makes your function asynchronous. And in the previous example, when we, in the synchronous example, when we got the request, we just accessed the post data on an attribute on the request object. But here we call this get post data function. And the reason for that is that in a synchronous web server, traditionally, if a request comes, we read the whole request, pack it into a Python object, and hand it over to a request handler. But an HTTP request is usually compromised of a request line, which indicates the HTTP method and the path, followed by a bunch of headers, and then potentially a request body. And the request body might be fairly large. It might be a video, might again be a, a GIF of a dog or a cat. And so in the asynchronous world, usually we only read the request line and the headers. So at that point, the request handler can already do a lot of um, checking. It can check if the path we're trying to access even exists. If not, it can just stop the request and uh, stop, um, not waste any time reading all that data from the client. Or it might check cookies or authorization headers to see if the client is even allowed to do what they want to do. But the change, but what that means is that now we, instead of just accessing the post data, we have to await the post data. And this is where the async magic comes in because while we await this data to arrive, our event loop, our asynchronous framework, can go handle all the other requests. They can call other Python code. And when we eventually get all the data from the client, it will return to our function and assign it to data and we will continue. And then in a second line, uh, we do basically the same thing. When we write to the database, we write to the database, and then we have to wait for the database to respond with an, yes, I saved this item to the database. And again, because of the await keyword, uh, while, this, while we wait for the database to respond or finish responding, we can go handle other requests and do other things. And lastly, in Rather than just returning a response object, what usually happens in async is you create a response object somehow from a request uh, with the HTTP status and the headers, and then you write to it. And you can write to it multiple times, and then you eventually finish it. Now, in our simple example, we don't really need that. We could just return a response object because it's so simple and small. But imagine you're generating a CSV file on the fly, and you might query a database uh, multiple times to fill the data. And in that case, you could do one query and then write that to the CSV and write it directly to the client and asynchronously keep filling data from your data store into the CSV and then finish it. And this way, the response will be a lot more responsive on the client side. So again, let's see what happens if uh, we have two requests coming in. The first request will start getting to the read post data and then while it's waiting, actually the second request will also start awaiting post data. And then they will, maybe the second request was faster because it has a better internet connection or the first request uploaded a huge amount of data, the second request just a tiny little bit. So they can actually get out of sync and, but they can just step through uh, kind of in parallel or um, together and be done with it. So why does this work? Again, it works despite us still having only one process, we only have one thread, but while one request is waiting for data to arrive or data to be written and returned, the other requests can be handled by our system. And if that whole code was uh, confusing, uh, let's just give an analogy of a restaurant. Imagine you open a restaurant here on the beach in Rimini and a customer comes in and they want a five course meal. And you say, no problem, sir, sit down, and you start serving them the meal. And now a second customer comes and they want a coffee, and you say, no, sir, or no, ma'am, you have to wait till this other person finishes their five-course meal before we will give you your coffee. Now, this is a problem because now you have like all these people waiting outside your restaurant to be served, so obviously what you're gonna do is you open more restaurants so you can still serve one customer at a time. That's what we do in Django and Flask. <laughs> 
And an alternative, and I know this is crazy, but an alternative would be to have more than one table, and if a customer comes in, you seat them at the table, and then you have your event loop or your waiters, go to them and ask them what they want, send them to your database or uh, your kitchen, I'm sorry, and they will serve them data, uh, food. And then that way you can, your kitchen still doesn't have to be able to handle everything at once, but your customers can gradually get your, their stuff uh, earlier. So let's bring all these theory a bit uh, more to reality and a little bit of story time of uh, where I work. Uh, my day-to-day -day job is building a single sign-on and access control uh, system where people can log in to various services. So we need to handle a lot of login requests, primarily on Monday morning when everybody comes to the office and starts their computer. So we've been using Tornado for a while, but we've not really been using it correctly for various reasons, and it wasn't really async. So what we did is we converted our main handlers to async. And we are still using Python 2.7 at this point. We are still using the normal Tornado system. And we're actually making heavy use of threats here uh, at this stage because we have a lot of legacy code that relies on legacy APIs, et cetera, that would be hard to just upgrade to async in one go. But so we just basically move all our IO out into uh, a th a something called a threat pool executor and looked at it. And Actually, just doing this, we were able to reduce our number of servers we need on a Monday morning by 25%. Now, some people might say 25%, that's nothing. I mean, it's not even an order of magnitude. Who cares? But in our case, it was actually several thousands of dollars a month. And the very, very interesting thing here is that our business logic, the thing we actually care about, the, the part of our application that does interesting things, or what we think is interesting things, stayed the same. All that we had to change is those little bits of code that um, do I.O. Now, this is because we already were using Tornado. If you're on Django, this will be harder. But still, the interesting thing is that these days, if you're doing asynchronous Python code, your code will look more or less the same, except every time you, use I, you do I.O., you might have an await statement or something like that there. So let's get back to my talk title, why you might want to go async. And maybe a better question than that would be, why, do you, why might you want to go async now? Because async has been around in Python forever. I've been doing Twisted since basically when I started learning Python. I've dabbled with it a little bit. And they've been doing async since forever. So why now? And the very big reason for that is basically Python 3.6.1. Um, async I.O. was added in the standard library in 3.4, but you still needed to use decorators to co define your coroutines. You had to use yield and yield from and all these kinds of things that just didn't really feel right. And then 3.5 added async and await keywords, which meant you can now make your code look beautiful. And 3.6 added a whole, um, a whole slate of new uh, great tools such as async iterators, async generators. And you can use, have async four. You can even have async list and dictionary comprehension. And you can have async context managers. So just like in your synchronous code where you would use a with statement for a, a file, you can use a with statement for a client session or a, a database session or something like that, but in an asynchronous context. And because of this whole thing with Python 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6, doing all this async stuff in the standard library, what actually happened in the wider ecosystem is we had a little asynchronous revolution in Python. All these crazy projects started popping up left, right, and center and making the asynchronous uh, environment in Python a lot stronger. Uh, we have a project called, there's a project called UV loop, which uses the same event loop that um, Node.js is built on, which is very, very efficient, and brings that to Python. So it's compatible with async.io. So if you're using async.io, you can just switch it out and according to their benchmarks, it's a lot faster. Uh, there's a thing called AIOPG, which I mentioned before, which is a Postgres client library, which again, according to their benchmarks, is faster than, for example, the Golang Postgres client, which I don't know how they do it, but apparently they do it, and it's amazing. And there's Scenic, which the, some of you might have seen a talk on yesterday, which is a Flask-like web framework, and that is also incredibly fast. And there's all these other AIO libraries out there um, these days, 
and that really like you build great good stuff. And the greatest, probably the greatest thing about async I.O. being in the standard library is that we now have a common way to do async in Python, which means even though we are using Tornado, thanks to async I.O., I'm now able to use async I.O. libraries. I'm, I'm able to use Tornado Twisted libraries. I'm able to use all these libraries together thanks to the standard standardization that async I.O. gave us. So to continue this little success story we had with our lock-in handlers from before, uh, what I did a few months ago is I upgraded our app from 2.7 to 3.6.1. The main thing I did for that is I replaced the Tornado event loop with an async I.O. event loop. It's still Tornado, it's, we still use the framework, which is use a different loop. I was able to remove about 20 dependencies because they were no longer required on 3.6 because they fixed things that were fixed in three, backported stuff to two. And I only had to rewrite really two dependencies we had, um, our APNS client library to talk to Apple push notification services and some Google APIs. Now the Google APIs run, work on 3.6, um, but the upgrade path wasn't clear and obviously the Google client library is synchronous, so it wasn't really interesting for us. So I had to rewrite it. And we were able, because of the switch to async IO main loop, we were able to use some of the async IO libraries that are out there and use better and get rid of some of the threading we need used and use actual real async. The result, uh, three times speed up of our request handler. And I'm gonna be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure why it is three times faster, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, to recap, uh, why you might want to go async. You want, you want to go async to save money, primarily. And you want to go async now because, because it's ready and mature in Python and it's really nice and awesome to use. And please use Python 3.6. It's not just great for async, it's great for basically everything out there. And yeah, and with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free and, or hit me on Twitter. Hey, thanks for your talks, very interesting. Um, in the current Ubuntu long-term support version, 16.04, uh, I mean 16.04, uh, the Python version is 3.5. Would you run that or would you install a 3.6 anyway and run that? I would Assuming you're using that. Yeah, Ubuntu I would install 3.6, that's, that's what I do. We, we don't use Ubuntu, we use, a different, we use Docker, but we use a different base image and I just install Python 3.6 because it, yeah, it, you can definitely use 3.5 to do async, it's just your, li your life as a developer, you will be a lot happier on 3.6. And of course, with uh, Homebrew on the Mac, you got uh, 3.6 as well, so then uh, the environments are more similar. Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. Okay. Uh, one question I noticed, one thing I noticed myself when developing async apps in Python is that generally in async world, file system support is not really good. Let's say you have to code uh, workarounds to make it work with file system in async apps, maybe like dedicated to some thread pools for like uh, file system storage and retrieval and stuff like that. So how do you manage that? Yes, so um, it's called async IO, but uh, one big part of the IO spectrum, which is files, is not actually included usually. And that is because, from what I understand, and I'm no ex expert on that part, but I, as far as I understand, for example, the Linux kernel doesn't really, or Linux file systems don't really do async I.O. at all. So there, you have to find a workaround anyway. And yeah, the general workaround suggestion seems to be using thread pools. What I found is that in, because we run a web server, usually, during a request, we never have to hit the file system. We need to hit the file system when we start the app a lot to load certificates, to lo load settings files, to load uh, templates, etc. So we just do that in the startup and uh, take a little bit of a pen um, performance hit on startup, have the startup be a little bit slower, but then try to avoid to hit the file system. If you need to hit the file system, threats are basically the only, like the best options you have, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Jonas. Um, it doesn't always seem to be very easy to tell in advance what speed gains or other gains, uh, resource gains you might make by putting in the effort to go asynchronous. In fact, you said that you weren't even sure why you were getting some of the gains you did. What strategy would you use to, to decide whether or not to put that effort in? So yeah, um, so with the speed gains, uh, an important thing to realize here is that asynchronous, async I.O. will not necessarily make your app faster. What it will make is make it more efficient. So a single request might be handled slower than if you were in a synchronous world because it has to share some of its time and resources with other requests. But if you have 100 requests, in general, those 100 requests will be finished in an aggregate faster than if you de did it in a synchronous world. So yeah, th that's one of the reasons why we were surprised to see such a speed up because we were expecting to just see a lot less CPU usage and lot less memory usage, but we didn't um, expect it to translate directly into a speed gain. And to your question on how you should choose if you want to do async or not, I would say always go async. Because these days it's not that expensive, uh, uh, not that taxing on, a, on your mental um, thing if you're doing uh, for your programming because it's uh, getting a lot more convenient and easy to write and read async code. So I would actually say you, you probably always want to go async simply because of the, all the benefits you get from it. Um, the only reason why you might not want to go async is if you are strongly bound to an existing framework or code base, such as uh, Django, Flask, whatever, or if there's really no way to talk to the third-party services that you need uh, in an asynchronous fashion. Hi, I was just wondering how badly are you able to shoot yourself in the foot if you, uh, for instance, would await a function that does logical computations instead of doing I.O.? Sorry, if, if, you're doing, if you're awaiting a function that doesn't yeah. do I.O.? That, that doesn't do I.O. Like, I was wondering, like, I'm still in the... Yes, yeah. So if you, call a, if, you call a, if you await a function that is not a coroutine, it will just give you an error. If you await a function that is a coroutine but is actually doing like heavy blocking computational stuff, that is really bad uh, because it will block your whole event loop. And there's an environment variable you can set uh, primarily for development called uh, Python async IO debug. Uh, if you set that to one, it will actually in the console warn you if a single call to a coroutine takes too long. And so, yeah, if you're doing computationally heavy stuff, you still have to use the same tools and strategies that you would always use in Python, which is either send it to a different process or a different thread so you don't block your whole application. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? No. Okay. Th yeah, thank you.